tell you that uh, I am a bit nervous. Um, you did this like two. It's, what's that? You did this like I'm working on it. Yeah, we really need the pictures because the pictures are fabulous. Yeah. Um, to speak in your hometown, it's, 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 uh, it's a bit unnerving. Unlike when you're going out across the state and talking to audiences you don't know. And so anyway, thanks for coming. I appreciate that. And, and uh, I have to tell you that my favorite audience are, are nine-year-olds. And I used to be able to say that that was my usual audience. But since the whole controversy has erupted with Stadium Woods, it's, I think the, the focus has shifted a little bit. I'm talking to more and more adults than I ever have. Um, and much of the talk that I'll give you today is actually um, evolved from talking to children. And I always start with this picture because it, it's fascinating to me that all children are a bit aggravated by the fact that their parents and their grandparents and their brothers and sisters call them by a wrong name from time to time. And so I always start with this picture. It happens to be the cover of the book. And I'll mostly be talking about remarkable trees, but hopefully I'll tell you about how some of the things I've learned from the Remarkable Tree Project um, relate to the, the trees that are in Stadium Woods and, and why I think it's so important to keep them. But uh, in any case, we, uh, we start the, the cover of the book is the tulip poplar, and it is misnamed. Uh, it's not a poplar. It's actually a magnolia. And I tell kids that um, Europeans in America have been calling this tree by a wrong name for 400 years, ever since they arrived. And they're probably not going to change, so they need to get over the fact that by the wrong name. But I'd like to point out to adults that it, this really is a celebration in a way because the Europeans that settled this country, uh, whether you look at the accounts of the Spanish, the French, or uh, especially the English, when they, when they described what they saw, they almost universally were astounded by the abundance that they found here, and not just the abundance by the biodiversity. And the reason why we call so many trees by wrong names is because the biodiversity is so much greater here. And oftentimes, they didn't have names for what they saw. And they would adopt Indian names, like sassafras, persimmon. Um, even hickory is an Indian name. And sometimes they just flat out got it wrong. And in this case, they got it wrong. So we call it a tulip poplar, but it's actually a tulip tree. And it's a wonderful reminder of what we have. And probably the reason why the Europeans were astounded is that they had pretty much deforested their country. And they were coming here for natural resources, to exploit more resources. And most of us are descendants of European people. And I think that our own Western viewpoints oftentimes um, are not always positively reflected on trees. And hopefully I'll be able to touch with that without stepping on too many toes. I have European ancestors like the rest of you. But I think we are in, uh, we are in North America and we ought to be Americans. And I think part of our Americans is to be proud of our trees. So we'll go, oh, I guess I've I, I got to do my own. You want me to do them for you, Jeff? That would be great. Thank you. Glad to. And I think the way I've got this, yeah, I've got it organized by our book track, uh, chapters. And so that's what I'm comfortable with talking about. So we'll talk about old trees first, and we'll, we'll hit these other categories. We'll spend a lot of time on history trees. When I'm with kids, I talk about the unique trees because they love the weird book and stuff. But we'll do a lot on old and historic. So we'll do the old first. And when we chose the trees uh, to be included in our book, we weren't quite sure how to approach old trees. And certainly part of the allure, part of the, the unique nature of the stadium woods is their exceedingly old age. So there are two ways of accomplishing this. It's very difficult to age some of these old trees. As trees get older, they get hollow interiors. Of course, they're, oftentimes their sheer size prevents us from being able to core into them. And if they're hollow, we have to extrapolate their age uh, because they leave no record once it, uh, once it rocks and the rings are gone. Um, so this is a tree that was hollow. We'll never know how old it is, but we do know that um, northern white cedar, which is not a cedar, by the way. It's another misnamed uh, tree uh, from the Europeans. But we do know that this tree is exceedingly, can be exceedingly old. It's been aged at 1,500 years old, growing out of uh, Niagara Falls. A lot of people were surprised to learn that we do have really old trees that grow in the east, and the potential age is, 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 is very old. And so that's the reason why I put this in there. This happens to be the largest northern white cedar in the United States. It's in Allegheny County, Virginia. So we'll go on. And this is to make another really critical point, and I, don't, I haven't 
seen Dr. Tobin Heber, but uh, I always have to meet, be sure I say this, because she might be in my audience, and she likes to make the point that you can no more judge a tree's age by its size than you can judge a person by their weight, the person's age by their waist size. And so this tree is um, on the cliffs at Pembroke, overlooking the New River. It's about six inches in diameter. And trees this size in the same area have been aged at over 500 years old. And they're exceedingly old because there's very little soil for them to, to grow and develop. And being a small tree is actually an advantage if you want to grow old because you're less likely to topple over due to wind or ice or something like that. You're less likely to attract a logger who wants to make lumber out of you. And so uh, we do have a lot of old growth and the trees, stands in Virginia, but they're usually of this nature, very small, the kind of like chestnut oaks that you'll see along the Appalachian Trail that you walk uh, between. And most people don't realize they're walking from an old growth stand because the trees may only be that big but they could be hundreds of years old. But this is what people like to see when they think about old trees. They like to see old growth stands. And I put this in here. This is the, this is the tree that, and the picture that we use to illustrate this point in the book. This is an old growth stand in Shenandoah National Park. And people focus, tend to focus on the very large trees, and I understand that. But scientists that are working in old growth are really more interested in the other stuff. And one of them is the amount of coarse woody debris. And when you walk in stadium woods, that's one of the things that you notice immediately is there is a lot of what we call coarse woody debris. And that is not something that you want to pull out and clear away to make it look neat and look like an English park. Uh, an old growth forest has a lot of coarse woody debris. And to some of us, we need to change the way we look at that. That is valuable and, uh, and priceless uh, and rare. And, and that's what you're looking for in this picture. And um, this is to make the point, this is another old growth stand. This was actually used by Dr. Staley in Arkansas. Many people uh, know about this tree indirectly. From this, we were able to um, determine a climate scenario for the last 500 years based on these tree ranks. There's actually 12 trees over 800 years in this picture. And this is the stand that they poured. And we also learned that this is uh, about the, James, the starving time of Jamestown. And terrible drought that they had at the time based on these trees. But I put it in here to make the point that most of our old growth stands in Virginia and throughout the east are on lands that were either too wet, too steep, or too rocky to farm. And that's the case here, and that's the case in western Virginia. So an old growth forest like the one that we have in Stadium Woods is exceedingly unusual, exceedingly rare. And um, John Seiler, who is here in the audience, has done a lot of work to see if anybody knows of a stand that is as rare as that one, and, and we have not come up with any, I think it's safe to say, it, it, that of that size and with this number of trees. There are 56 trees that are over three feet in diameter, and we haven't been able to age them all, but their ages range from, I want to say, 200 to 350 years old, which is, which is pretty rare in the eastern U.S. Okay, you're moving me right along, and I thank you for it. Let's go to historic trees. This is a... <laughs> Okay, I, I, that's good. This is a campus tree. This is at Hampton University. I wish that we had a tree culture here at Virginia Tech like they had at Hampton University. When uh, Nancy, Bob, these are my co-authors on the book, and I went out looking for trees that people had nominated, it wasn't always easy to find them. But when we arrived at Hampton University, the first person we asked, and thereafter, everybody we asked, every alumni you ever talked to, they all know about this tree. This tree is central to their culture on that campus. It's the Emancipation Oak. It's the first, uh, it's the place where the first reading of the Emancipation Proclamation was made in the South. And it was made underneath that tree because it was not legal to teach blacks how to read. So they would meet underneath that tree, learn how to read. Booker T. Washington was their most famous student and the university grew up around that tree. And, and it's a cherished tree. It's the only place where I saw that they actually moved buildings to give the tree room to grow. Now, tell me if you've ever seen that on our campus or any other campus for that matter. This is a large white oak called the Brompton Oak at the University of Mary Washington. Our trees are equally this size. They're not open grown, so they don't have that park-like view that descendants of Europeans like to see. Um, but anyway, we included this because somebody told us that there was a picture of this tree in the National Archives. And so, the next picture is what we got. That's the same tree in 1864. 
These are soldiers recovering from their wounds at the Second Battle of Fredericksburg. If you look, you can see an amputated arm here and an amputated leg. And I like to put this in here because uh, sometimes we can be told that the tree is old and that the tree was alive during this historic event. But in the rare instance when you can actually see a picture of it, it sinks in a little bit better. And so there's that aspect. But the other aspect is fascinating to me is something that we are just rediscovering in the, uh, in the area of urban forestry. And that is the connection between trees and people. These soldiers know that to heal, they need to be out of the hospital and underneath a tree. And we've found that people heal faster in the presence of nature and in the presence of trees. Children study better. There's even reduced violent crime. There's an example of where they removed um, old vegetation from a public housing project, and there was a 65% increase in violent crime. And so trees do apparently have an amazing ability to calm people. And that's something I think, just for public safety's sake, we need to cherish here and keep at Virginia Tech. This is the hospital where those soldiers' arms and legs were amputated, and this was the surgeon's room right there. And Claire Barton was the nurse, and they threw the amputated limbs, and they piled up between these two catalpa trees until they would get a wagon load, and they would bring the wagons in, they'd load them on the wagons, they'd cart them out, and they'd bury them. And the reason why I found out about this tree was because uh, I was trying to find the, the tree where Stonewall Jackson's arm was buried, and, uh, which I thought was kind of uh, uh, obscure enough to put in the book and capture everybody's attention. And, and they were underneath catalpa trees, but it was, and it was owned by the same people that owned this, this house. This house is now a National Historic Landmark. It's just south of Fredericksburg. And uh, that's, the, uh, that's the tree. Tom's moving me on. Uh, we know about this whole story because Walt Whitman went looking for his brother to see if, he'd see if he survived. And he wrote a book called The Wound Dresser in which he describes the catalpas and the, and the amputated limbs. And the point that I make with this is that it, we tend to, in America, to glorify and try to preserve our buildings and to make a big deal about them. And the buildings are dead. They're long gone, and even the shriveled up pieces of paper. And usually, we can go on these historic sites, and we can walk around, and the trees are still there. And they're still alive. And this is a tree, a historic tree that's very, very closely related to what we have at Stadium Woods. This is this was a large tree that was alive during a massacre in Highland County. It's usually called a massacre if the Indians won the event. But it dates to the time, the 1750s, when Western Virginia was just being settled, the Indians were still defending their land, and there were a lot of skirmishes. And so we put this tree in the book. Uh, it also happens to be the largest um, swamp white oak in, in, the, uh, in the country. And uh, there's a lot of things I can say about this. One thing I want to, we, we forget that we have, a, we have our own history in America that dates before Europeans. And the rivers in this county are the calf pasture, the bull pasture, and the cow pasture. And most people think it's named for cows, European cattle. But it's not. It's named for bison. And bison used to roam in Virginia all the way onto the Piedmont. Uh, uh, back in those days, and our place names. In fact, here's a map of the uh, says Elk Island National Park. It, it is the historic range of the Plains Buffalo, which goes, extends into the Virginia Piedmont. So we do have a fascinating history, and these trees date to that history. The other thing I want you to see, there's my co-author, Nancy Hugo, to give you some idea of the size of this tree. It's enormous. Um, it is barely alive. It's a snag, and and as I understand it, we're getting ready to remove one of those snags in Stadium Woods in the next week or so, or at least there are plans to remove it. But these snags are incredibly important in an old-growth forest because they are literally a home for wildlife. And I like this one because it shows a hollow tree with an above-ground entrance. Now, I'm not gonna, this is not the same tree, but it is a tree here in Giles County, so if we can go to that. And this is a picture inside a similar tree in Giles County. What you're seeing are four bears. Here's bear cub number one, two, three, and they're laying on top of their mother, and that's a radio collar, and this is one of our graduate students at Virginia Tech, who, is, uh, who has climbed up the tree, is tied to a rope, and is going down inside to dart the mother and take a blood sample, and she got a photograph. And you can't imagine
imagine how much children love this picture, but adults do too. So these trees are important to mammals, to birds. They are an integral part of an old growth forest. And you can't have an old growth forest. You can't really call it old growth without this kind of tree. Another historic tree, Thomas Jefferson planted the tulip poplar that you see that's reflected in the pool. And when he planted it, he noted in his garden book, oh, what I would give to be alive when this tree towers over Monticello. And of course, he never saw that tree. He never saw it as, as a large tree. I put it in here because the tree died recently. And when it died, I went back and I looked at the picture and I thought, why didn't I notice that? Look at the crown and look at the cedrella on the other side. You can see a full crown, a healthy tree. But so many people have walked on these roots over the years that they've compacted the soil. And trees are on a different life cycle than we are. They don't die overnight. Sometimes they'll take 10, 20, 30, even 200 years to die. It takes them a long time. But you can clearly see that this tree was in decline, and we didn't even notice it when we took the photograph. But there it is. And you can see a tree that was about to die from soil compaction. This flabbergasted me when uh, two years, three years after we did the project, I don't know why we decided to photograph our eastern red cedars in the eastern part of the state, because red cedars love limestone and calcareous soil. And when you abandon farmland here in the Ridge and Valley province on our limestone soils, they almost always pop up with thousands of cedar trees. And so this is kind of like the place to photograph cedar trees. And yet, for some reason, we chose this location. And I went back to do a workshop for some historic tree preservation people. And they were showing me how they um, do a risk assessment of trees. And, uh, and, I, and I walked underneath these trees. And we were looking at these trees and, and, uh, and, and the risk factors. And I noticed everywhere I went, I was kicking oyster shells. And then it suddenly dawned on me. Those trees are there because George Washington was born on a shell bit. And this is the George Washington birthplace, because the shells are providing the calcium that you would normally get on limestone soils. And then I dug further. I was asked to do a project at Westmore, in Westmoreland County at, at uh, Stratford Hall, Robert Leaves' birthplace. And I read more, and it turns out that this shell midden was occupied for 5,000 years continuously uh, by Indian people. And so when we talk about sustainability, I think we've got to get beyond styrofoam, and we've got to talk <laughs> about a civilization that could live, and not only live symbiotically with their, uh, with their surroundings, but they were, they were building up a, um, a food source. And the reefs, when, uh, when, when the first people came into the Chesapeake, were so large that they were barriers to uh, navigation that had to be overcome. So we're moving into champion trees. I think this one's short on time. This, is, this, at one time, was the largest tree in Virginia, as big as a silo. These are my heroes. Byron Carmine's a retired school teacher, and, and Gary Williamson is a retired park ranger. And they spend every weekend of their life looking for big trees. And they found this stand, and this stand had been undiscovered uh, until 2005. The state bought it as a natural area. In fact, these guys have found three natural areas that have been purchased by the state. And uh, they believe this tree is 2,000 years old. It's hollow. We'll never know how old it was. It died. And a lot of people were, were disappointed when it died. But they were quick to point out that this tree will probably stay standing as a snag for 100 years at least. And so your grandchildren can go see this tree in all likelihood. This is to show you that not all big trees are big. Uh, we have sarvis berries. It's a small diminutive tree. Beautiful, beautiful in the spring. We have it planted on campus. It's got a wonderful edible fruit. Uh, it figures prominently in ceremonies uh, throughout the Plains and the Plains Indians. They make pemmican out of it. Uh, we have the sarvis berries growing in stadium woods as an understory tree. And this is the largest one in the United States. And it's in Burke's garden. Sassafras. That's a sassafras. And it can get big. Sassafras is another Indian word, by the way. Okay. Community trees, I think, are next. Let's go on. I love this tree for a number of reasons. This is in, uh, this is in Richmond. They've made the conscious decision to go ahead and let the thousands of children climb it every year and it hangs in there. It's a red mulberry. The one thing I didn't tell you about the white cedar is the French called it arborvitae because when they arrived here at the New World, they were suffering from scurvy, like most of the Europeans had made that long voyage across the ocean, and they lacked vitamin C. And the Indians fed them a tea made of 
of arborvitae. Arborvitae means tree of life. And the red mulberry was the tree of life for the Jamestown settlers because when they arrived, and for the French settlers uh, when they arrived in Florida, because the Indians fed the mulberries, their first uh, fresh fruit from the New World. And I think I have a, actually a watercolor. This is from France. I mean, this is, this is the French from the St. John's River. Basically, they're arriving in Jacksonville, Florida, which is what we now call. And the picture, the text that goes with this, describes the Indians bringing them baskets of red and white mulberries to feed them when they arrived. And you can read the Jamestown accounts and hear this and see, read the same thing. The significance of white mulberries was mean, means that the Indians, if that is true, have already adopted a European fruit and were probably growing it in orchards at, at the St. John's River in Jacksonville in 1562. And here's just, I, I love this. Uh, the Spanish also describe uh, this orchard as two to 3,000 acres at Kikotan, which is now the city of Hampton. And they're talking about those large mulberries that the Indians were growing. I put this in. This is a community tree. It was first nominated as a big tree, but it was the second largest. And I told the lady, don't be disappointed. You don't have the largest tree, but you've got the second largest chain of Pinocchio in Virginia. And you should be proud. And she died, and somebody else nominated it as a community tree when we did the remarkable tree. And, and I always wondered uh, how that went. I was really relieved that she didn't get mad at me. And it turns out when she died, she left this tree in her will. And she said, whoever inherits this piece of property has to take care of this tree, has to preserve its life. And so um, it just so happened that the Page County Board of Supervisors bought her property. And they discovered her will, or somebody discovered her will, hired an arborist. And the arborist set off the root protection zone of this tree. And what most people don't realize is that the, the roots extend far beyond the crowns. And the root protection zone of a large tree like this is roughly half the size of a football field. And so with the arborist's report and calculations and the will, they went and there was this battle between the Page County Board of Supervisors bought the property, put a county, county office building, <laughs> and they determined that there wasn't room for the tree and the county office building both. And who do you think won? Now some of you know the answer already. But the tree won. The tree won. So let's hope our trees win. That you should never allow ivy to grow on the tree like they had on that. Yeah. Oftentimes we think that sports and trees are in conflict, so I like this picture. This is the girls' soccer team at E.C. Glass High School in, uh, in Lynchburg. And that's a southern red oak, and they love their tree, and they love playing soccer on their tree. And that's proof. Okay, unique trees. I just got to show you these. A lot of times when you have old growth forest, you know, you wonder what is the value of an old growth forest. And I don't even want to begin to get into that. But one of the, one of the things that I learned from this, this old growth forest that Byron and Gary found uh, in southeastern Virginia that, uh, on the Nottoway River, which flows into the Albemarle, uh, in, into the North Carolina Sounds, by the way, is that trees take on different forms and shapes and growths that we've never even imagined before. And these are water tubulos. And I doubt whether anybody knew water tubulos could ever even look like this. This is called Cypress Bridge. And there's another water tubulo. We've had 18 adults inside that tree. and could have had more, according to Byron, if we just had more adults. This is the inside. Nobody's been able to quite explain how that pattern got to be. Wow. This is another, exceeding, probably exceedingly old. They think this is all that's left of the original trunk. They don't think that this was a nurse log situation, which is <coughs> fairly common. And you can see that a little bit is left of the crown. But a lot of these trees um, get hit by hurricanes, and it's not unusual for them to lose their crown and to survive. OK, so probably going to find specimens. Yeah, yeah, this is a lot of people think our elms are dead, but this, they're not. They're still around. We have some beautiful ones on campus. Of course, we've lost some. Uh, but this is the Roanoke Country Club. and. Um, some preschoolers uh, gave names to most of the trees in the book, and I love their name for this. It was called, they called it the cupcake tree. <laughs> and I think, yeah, I've got hickory. This is one of my favorites. Um, hickory is an Indian word. Uh, native uh, people did not have dairy cows. That was, that was for the Europeans to bring over. But they did have hickory trees. And they made a milk and a cream out of hickory milk. They would smash the nuts, boil them, and, and take the oil which floated to the top. And hickory is an Indian word. It, it refers to uh, hippora, which was the milk that they made out of. And bats will roost underneath the, uh, the bark on 
shagbar hickory. This tree died, uh, so I'm, I'm going to show you what I think is going to be the. Oh no, I guess I have William Bartram's quote. I love this. This is you know this is 150 years after the Spanish came. Uh, so put that in perspective. But he still is making notes. Of course, he's a trained botanist, so we're getting a different view now, a kind of more more scientific view of, of what they're seeing. And here he's talking about a family gathering 100 bushels of hickory nuts for use. That's a lot of hickory nuts, and it was so important to him. And he talks about hominy and corn cakes and all of that. So anyway, this this is um, we found this tree afterwards. The house behind there is Robert Duvall, the, the actor. I told him uh, to go out and bring, bring him out so we could meet him, but the, I was probably the only person in the United States that didn't know who he was. But um, <laughs> I know who he is now. But anyway, that's his house, and that's his tree in front of his house. And that's a shell bark every, um, which is an even rarer tree. And my guess is it was probably intentionally planted in front by, by natives uh, for its nut. It has a huge nut. The second largest shell bark hickory is uh, in front of Stratford Hall, Robert E. Lee's uh, birthplace. So now we're going to go to the mighty oaks. No, or maybe noteworthy. Oh, we put, I put this in here because I wanted to remind everyone, you know, um, smart people can make big mistakes. <laughs> and I, I know that because... Well, I don't want to say I'm smart, but I know I've made big mistakes. We all make big mistakes. So, but I want to put this in to remind everybody how important it is to listen to children. Now, this is something that we did not know. We never thought about it. But a child showed us we had the hardest time figuring out what kind of picture we were going to put in for Red Button. We knew we had to have Red Button book. So, Tom, if you go on, a three-year-old showed us that a Red Button blossom looks like a hummingbird. Now, how many of you have ever noticed that? And most of us would consider ourselves pretty smart. So listen to children and watch children's reactions and learn from them. Oh, and a... <laughs> Look, that's a flock of hummingbirds. Okay. All right, so Mighty Oaks. Now we're ready for Mighty Oaks. This is one of the big... And we have these large, big oaks all over Blacksburg, all over Blacksburg, and all over the campus. And it's just, just amazing when you stop and think about it. Uh, open-grown trees were, probably grew up in the open. And of course, Blacksburg at one time was called Draper's Meadow. Christiansburg was Hans Meadow. We have Blade Road. Our place names indicate that a lot of this area was probably grassland and savanna. And the trees that were in that grassland and savanna are still here, which is amazing. It's our history. Next one. We had so many oak nominations that we had to make a separate chapter for oak, mostly white oaks. People love their white oaks. And I would say that the people that come to a Virginia football game are coming as much to get out of Northern Virginia and Hampton Roads to be back here in our landscape, which includes all the oaks and all the beautiful fall colors. So I think it's part of the football package. Okay, let's go. This is one tree that we just found. Um, Another part of Virginia that was probably cleared, uh, the Plains, Virginia, Della Plain. The place names tell you what was there. That was a chestnut oak, by the way, John. You've probably never seen an open-grown chestnut oak quite like that. Um, this is a white oak. That's up in Clark County. I put this one in here. This is a large chestnut oak. It's actually in Fairfax. Um, uh, there was a time when people used to preserve the large trees, and they would even name streets when they built developments. They, they do it less now, at least it seems to me. Uh, but this is Rocky Run subdivision, and uh, they let this, they gave this tree room to grow, and they named uh, the street after it. And I, I included the picture because of the next one, the next slide. I like to show kids this. This is uh, the the photographer Robert Llewellyn came back, and he took an acorn from the tree and he planted it and he photographed it as it grew. And so I like to show kids this picture and I say, Would you like to see that tree's baby picture? And so this is the baby picture of the tree. And then I asked him, would you like to see the fourth grade picture? And this directly relates to Stadium Woods, so we'll look at that. This is, this of course is the tree at the end of its first year. And you see that it has just a few leaves. This tree I planted um, down below Cheatham Hall on the hillside, thinking that it might survive there and not get cut. No, no, we've got to go back. I've got to finish this. <laughs> the, uh, if you're a forester, you know that we, we kind of categorize trees by their, by their light or shade tolerance. And some trees... Uh, only grow in shade. Some trees require full sunlight. If you want to grow those kind of trees, the way you harvest to prepare for them is to have a clear cut. 
Uh, and, but then you have uh, oaks, which are kind of intermediate between the two. And one of their wonderful abilities is to hunker down and maybe put out two or three leaves a year, drop them, and slowly build up the root reserves. And so you can go out in stadium woods or in other places and see little tiny seedlings like this. And they could be 70 years old. They're just waiting for a canopy to open up. And that's the reason why we need to get beyond just saving the stadium woods. We've got to come up with a management plan. Because too often we allow people to go in and clear everything. And they're clearing really old seedlings that have just been waiting all this time. And, and we come in and we destroy it, thinking we're doing a good thing. Okay. We can all do things to preserve trees, like having our graduation ceremonies underneath the tree, like it's done at several elementary schools in Virginia. I'm surprised that one in. This one's in here to make a point. Uh, this is at a church in Albemarle County, and an arborist goes to the church, and underneath this tree, he placed a sign that says, Thou shalt not park. And the reason why he doesn't want parking is because he knows that if you allow trees to park on tree roots, you will eventually compact the soil, you lose the pore spaces, the tree cannot get water, cannot exchange gases with the atmosphere, and it dies. Usually a long, slow death, like you saw at Monticello. Thou shalt not park. Okay, tree places. Urban areas can be surprisingly good places to grow trees. We learned of this photograph, we went back to this new subdivision and photographed it a couple years ago and put it in the book, and that, that's the same. If you ever wonder if planting trees makes a difference, it does. Of course, it takes a while, but they can do well. They're probably reaching the limits of their of their growth because they grew up with all that impervious surface, and they've probably the roots have probably found places where they can get water and oxygen that they need. But my guess is they've reached their limit and um, begin to fall, fall apart. I like to show this because cemeteries are wonderful places for trees. And I like to point out to kids, I, I always ask them, where do you think this person that was buried, where do you think this person is now? And they sit there and it suddenly dawns on them that the person is actually now a tree. That person's bones and his flesh have decomposed and the tree, that the person is now a tree. <laughs> and we all become trees if we're lucky enough. And I'll never forget, a kid one time said, um, does that mean that, that we can be born again? I'm like, oh no. <laughs> That's what it means. He was, he was so happy, and the teacher was so relieved, and I've never heard anything like that. So, anyway, uh, we can be born again, and let's hope that we're reborn as trees. And, you know, I was a really big advocate for making sure that Virginia Tech was in our tree places chapter, because I think we do have some wonderful trees. I'm not pleased. I, I think we've got a long ways to go. I think we don't appreciate what we've got, but we can appreciate it, and we've still got a lot left. But, you know, that's just a gorgeous picture. And that stadium woods can be another duck pond. It can be another drill field. In fact, in my opinion, it would be even a greater asset to us. And it would benefit everybody. So uh, I think now we're going to jump into some stadium woods picture. And John is right here. Where'd John go? John Ford is in the picture. There he is. John, take it. <laughs> John is part of the Master Naturalist Group. And this is before we even knew what the plans were for, uh, for stadium woods. We just wanted to raise awareness, and we thought that, the, because it's been used as a dumping ground for many years, and we were hoping that would stop. And, um, and so we inventoried all the trees over a foot in diameter. I think there's something like over 600 trees, and there are 56 trees this size and larger, over three feet in diameter. And that's John that, that helped there. Uh, it, it was 57, but one died over the summer. And uh, one of our master naturalists actually went in last spring and listened and recorded the birds. So just, just last spring, say between February and, and May, he recorded over 60 species of birds, including a lot of the neotropical migrants. And you can, I think the next slide shows this. Oh, no, hopefully it will later on. But more pictures. There's the climbing tower. This, I think, is the tree that they're getting ready to remove because it's been deemed a hazard tree. But that's part of the problem. When you build uh, and you attract humans into a place, then, uh, you know, a tree is not a hazard unless there's a target. And so if you build things and if you bring people into it, then you, then you bring targets into it.
and you find reasons, people find reasons to cut the trees down. Okay, this is the one I want to show you. One, the, the whole idea, one of the one of the really special things about that woods, if you've never heard a bird migration, block off the last week of April on your calendar. You've got to be in a deciduous woods large enough to attract neotropical birds. But it's just like going down to the rainforest. You don't need to pay for an airline ticket because the birds come here. And and so this is one of this is one of the most common birds in all of eastern North America. We have it, I believe, nesting over there. And you can see that its winter home is South America, its summer home is North America. These birds fly at night. They're tiny, very tiny things. You usually don't see them. You have to learn their their song. And uh, they navigate by stars. And then they rest during the day. And they have to find a patch of woods big enough that they can see them. And nobody knows what the minimum size is. But we're guessing that when you take the whole footprint of this, of the practice facility that they want to put in, that it will take seven acres, which is half of the 14-acre woods. More pictures from Stadium Woods, just some of these big white oaks. That's it actually in the footprint of the building. Dogwood blossom. Um, I had another picture which I took out, but there are what I call wild azaleas. It turns out they're a rare rhododendron called Pinkster Flower. One of our former biology professors told me a couple weeks ago. This is tree number 101. John poured this a couple weeks ago. It's not by any means one of the larger trees. It's hollow in the middle, but it was aged at 346 years, which dates to 1665. Keep in mind that Europeans arrived in 1750, roughly. So this tree was an old tree when the Europeans were. John found this. You know, we don't have a Matthew Brady photograph, but we do have a Confederate map of Blacksburg. Here's Blacksburg, and there's Stadium Woods. It was there. That was before Virginia Tech, of course. Um, one of the things that I think is really important, and that's kind of the education factor, we need to keep the footprint honest. And it's easy to come in and build a building and say, it's only going to take this amount of space. But it's, it's more than that. If you go to a similar sized building, which is the Performing Arts Center, and GPS, like I did, walk around the perimeter, look at all the access roads that go into it, and that building, the footprint is 7.2 acres. And that's the reason why I say that this building is probably going to destroy, if, it's, if it goes in, it will probably destroy half the state of woods. That's just my guess. But it's based on the footprint of that existing building. The staging areas for these construction projects are massive. And you need to go look at it and wonder if old trees, 300-year-old trees, can survive that kind of, of disturbance. Um, one thing that's different about this, which makes it even more difficult to imagine trees surviving, is that there is a 45-foot elevation difference between the bottom of the hill and the top of the hill. And they estimate that they're going to have to move 80,000 cubic feet of dirt. And I don't know if they're going to pile it up on site, whether they're going to truck it off, but that's a lot. Stormwater, this is based on a, a model which probably underestimates uh, the amount of water, but a, a rainfall that you can expect to happen once every two years, uh, you will have to have to plan for an additional 52,610 cubic feet of water. But these models don't are, are never based on the idea that somebody might put an impervious surface on an old growth forest. They're usually modeled for you know a much more reasonable you know you know mid, middle age forest. So that's the reason why I say this is probably an underestimate. Uh, forest fragmentation. We could talk on and on about that, but once you isolate these trees, all sorts of bad things happen, and they eventually go. Um, the root protection zone is massive. There's a formula. It's 1.5 times the diameter uh, in inches. Only you're talking about feet from the tree. So a 36-inch diameter tree is going to need up to 72 feet radius around it to protect its tree roots. Minimum of acreage from neotropical birds we don't know. And then somebody else showed me their calculation. They got on the web. And this, again, was a model like the first one. And the building itself um, will consume or will produce 5,600 metric tons of CO2. We're, okay. We're at a good stage now, Jeff, okay. to, to, to turn the lights on and good. have a few questions, if that's okay with you. Oh, sure. And then uh, we'll have time for Caitlin. Thank you, John, uh, to, to set up.
Um, so the floor is open for a few questions, uh, comments. Uh, oh yeah, uh, John has a comment. The we 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 have uh, I don't know a couple months ago we set up maybe not a couple months a month ago or so we set up a a website where people could. Um, sign a petition saying that they were opposed to the location of the practice facility. It's not against the practice facility, it's against the location of the practice facility in State of Woods. And so if you do a web search um, for, uh, if you just type in Safe State of Woods, that petition will come up. And I think it's very important that you get as many signatures uh, for that, because I think that will help uh, people realize that there are people that value the woods. And uh, so I encourage you to do that. But this is another one. This is brand new, uh, which John just told me about this morning. This, uh, there is a committee that is, uh, I think as a result of the petition, there was a committee formed that is looking into uh, this whole issue. And they're going to give a recommendation at, at the, uh, probably by the 1st of June, I think. And so they have created another website to voice your opinions. And so if you're going to do, you need to do both. If you, if you, if you, feel strongly about the issue. So please uh, look for this one as well. This is, this is APFSEC. APFSEC. And, and of course the other one, I can't give you the web address, but just search for Save Stadium Woods and it will come up. Thanks, John. That's the same email. Oh, okay. It's, it's an email. And express, email. And express opinions. That they set up specifically to receive. And they and their and it's to gauge public opinion. Is that? Is that receive call so that the individuals don't get flooded. Okay. So it's the committee's email. Basically. Okay. Does right. the committee have a website? No. No. Any other quick comments? Yes. Go ahead. Um, you you call the stadium was old growth? Is that technically correct? Well, as a, like an ecosystem, or because I've heard the distinction that an old growth forest is more of an, e uh, an intact ecosystem. Um, I think I think it's safe to say yes. Yeah. When we when we first made the sign, we made the Master Naturalist and Bird Club and uh, Native Plant Society all pitched in, and we 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 uh, we uh, bought signs for the university to put up there, <laughs> and. Uh, so when we did the signs, we, 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 we hedged it a bit and, and said, you know, it, 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 has, it has all the characteristics of old growth. But I think now that we've learned more about it, John has done age structure and size structure, and it's like, it looks like a duck, it smells like a duck, it tastes like a duck, I, I think it is a duck. And I mean, it's got, it's, got, it's got every component of an old growth forest ecosystem that I know that people look for, every characteristic. It's got the dead snags, it's got the coarse woody debris, it's got the exceedingly old trees, um, it's got, it's, it is very small, 14 acres, but it's probably the largest <coughs> left on the East Coast of this type of forest. Um, so yeah, I think so. Yeah, but, but we wouldn't call it wilderness. <coughs> That's we wouldn't not call it wilderness. I, I hear people using that, that term in, 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 by, by far. Well, my American Indian ancestry makes me get hackles on my back when anybody calls any part of North America a wilderness. I don't think any part of North America can be accurately called a wilderness. People have lived here for a long time, and they have interacted, I'm, and certainly the people. Oh, oh, I'm going to cut this off, but I want, John, did you want to make a comment on the previous question, or the wilderness? Yeah, no. Or the other question. Oh, the, yeah, there's, there's a seven characteristics that, that if, you, if you look at old growth definitions and, and, and it, it varies but there are seven or eight characteristics that, you, you, that would make a forest full of growth and there's no question that it has every one and that's not to say it's not wilderness and it's not pristine it's been heavily abused but even a, a lot of the old growth in the east again common to old growth in the east are logging of their buffers. This, this is what's happened in the stadium. Woods has been nibbled at over the years. And the even invasive species are exceedingly common in old growth. And Jeff's referring to, when I, when I received comment from old growth experts in the eastern United States, like the leading experts, 
this parcel of land is exceedingly rare. And, and it very well, what I say is it very well may have the single largest collection of old growth white oak in one small area. This man said, said he knew of no other. Uh, and, and the fact that it's between black and where it is is what makes it exceedingly We've got uh, Caitlin Edenfield here who is going to speak about some of her work in the stadium woods. And then we have time. Jeff will stick around, I'm sure, afterwards to, for comments. And we can engage Jeff on this. And John will be here. Uh, so without further ado, I want to uh, jump into the next part of our program, which really dovetails nicely with uh, Jeff's last slide. We talked about the, the scope, the trees, not the trees that we see, but also the root structure. And Caitlin, we're delighted that you could come with us and talk a little bit about your uh, your work out there, which just finished uh, a week or so ago. Hi, I'm Caitlin Edmonfield. I want to thank you all for having me here today. Um, I'm a fifth year landscape architecture student, and I did a recent art installation in Stadium Woods, so that's kind of my connection to this, to this forum. Um, um, I'd like to start by sharing a little bit of my personal background, um, and then the, the process that I went through in doing the installation at Stadium Woods, and um, then kind of some conclusions that I've come to um, as a result of the installation. Um, so this is part of my fifth year landscape architecture um, final project, and I've done this the Stadium Woods installation was my second of two installations. The first was in part, and this was behind Burris in Birchard Plaza last October. Um, and the two installations are really connected because their goal is to get people to slow down, really recognize their surroundings, um, and kind of gain grounding uh, for where you are. So um, this installation was putting nature or um, material, nature, natural materials into a heavily man-made um, static environment, um, whereas the Finding Foundations installation in Stadium Woods was kind of the opposite. Um, um, so, really was interested in doing an installation in Stadium Woods as a reaction to some of the, the media that had been surrounding the, the issue of the proposed building. So I learned a lot about um, the proposed <coughs> athletic facility, but I needed to know more about the woods. Um, so, uh, so this was the image that I looked at um, first. So I was understanding the context and location of Stadium Woods. And um, you can tell that with the contrast of this map, there's two large, dark, or three dark sections of vegetation. So this is kind of the green infrastructure on campus. So, around the duck pond, the grove, um, the drill field, and then stadium woods. Um, and the drill field is obviously different than the grove and stadium woods um, in their makeup, which I think this map does a pretty good job of, of showing that um, stadium woods is kind of an island around a, a rising sea of development. Um, so took that idea, kind of talked with um, Jeff Kerwin and Susan Day and Eric Wiseman, because I'm no expert on, um, no, no expert on the ecosystems or the processes that happen in the woods. Um, but I did understand that they were important. And I did understand that, and I do understand that um, people need to be aware of what we have on campus. Um, so I wanted to really try and show that. So this is kind of the, a little bit of the ecosystems that I was aware of um, that are inherent in the woods and I wanted to portray through the installation. Um, so kind of the process of the installation. So I, the first time that I went to the woods, I noticed the surveyor tape. Um, and that always gets people thinking, you know, what is the fate of that tree? Or what is the fate of, what does the tape mean? Um, and it's so contrast to the, the nature in Stadium Woods. Um, so after talking with Dr. Kerwin um, and kind of finding out the um, building footprint, I used different color surveyor's tape. So the red tape 
was um, mapped the building footprint. The orange tape mapped the area, the 40-foot construction offset that they have taped out. The yellow um, was kind of the next tier of, um, of trees that would be impacted by the construction. And the pink tape kind of marked out the edges. Um, and uh, so I wanted to really emphasize the tree protection zones that um, Dr. Kerwin was talking about in his, in his uh, presentation. So what I did, what we did was we mapped the estimated tree protection zones. So using a different color tape, we'd start at the trunk of the tree, kind of make a skirt out of the tree. And as a result of that, you get an overlap <coughs> of all these different color tapes um, and all of, I mean, it made it, some people thought it was an eyesore, which was great because they were noticing it. That was okay. Um, but it made it a little bit difficult to walk through the woods, even better, because you're having to think about where you're walking. 